Hello and welcome to Occupy Brooklyn TV. I'm Kitana Andrews. And I'm Melanie Butler. In two separate incidents, on July 21st and 22nd, two unarmed young men were fatally shot by police in Anaheim, California. Thousands of demonstrators have taken to the streets in the days and nights since, only to be met with more police violence. Police have shot crowds with what are called less lethal weapons, such as rubber bullets and pepper balls and in one incident turned an attack dog loose on demonstrators. Citizen journalists continue to document the clashes between police and the residents of Anaheim. Let's have a look at these clips. Um, hi, what, what's your name? Um, Jocelyn. What, what, say it again? Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Oh, Jocelyn, um, so you were here protesting or you were just standing by and then the police started shooting rubber bullets and they, they ended up hitting you? Yeah. Can you, can you tell me like, from your side of the story, like, what was going on during that time? I just saw, like, um, the police um, grabbed a woman, and then they started shooting, oh like, God, shooting. Terrible. And then I, I ran, but I didn't know they shot me. But then I just felt something, burnt, like, it, like, it was burning my feet, my leg, and, and then, like, I saw, I saw, and I saw something white, but then I saw a mark on my leg, and it hurt it a lot. So, so there was, was there a lot of kids during that time? Yeah. And did you see like babies around, yeah. around too? Oh, so why would like the... two babies. Two babies? Yeah. Yeah, and I know. I, know. I, I was know running around. I, I know who got hit. And the police released the dog and, and, and the dog started to chase people around. Why would Anaheim like, police like do that to children? I you know. Think? It, let, it let the dog win and it started to bite my, bite my brother, then it let him a big cast. Who? It, it bit who? My brother. Oh, the, the dog bit your brother? They, they're saying that they let the dog go in accident, but it was not purpose. <laughs> yeah. Right. And they would tell the dog to stop, but then he just kept on going. There was like a carriage with the, where the baby was in it, and while they released the dog, the dog tumbled on like the la cariola of my brother. It threw my, my, brother's, my brother's baby's trailer. Then like, um, my sister-in-law got so scared. They, they, like, I, I, like, I, they, the, I sound like, people, like, people, 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 like, people, they running. Then me and my sister just ran because they were, they, they like, shooting. Yeah. And we were all, we, we were all scared. Um, I so did, any, did any other um, children get hit with the oh, rubber bullets? A five-year-old oh, girl, a five-year-old girl got hit in the eye. And a boy in the feet. Okay. And then, and then the, police, the police started shooting innocent people. The, the, those little, with the rubber bullets. Yeah, those rubber bullets. Uh, they were shooting people uh, and uh, arresting uh, innocent uh, people just for protecting uh, other people. Like and they have no idea what they're doing. And, and, they, and they hit a baby. They shot a boy with a paintball gun. And then he was shaking just like for nothing. And, and the police ended up shooting people twice. One at the day and one at the night. Okay, thank you very much. We Thanks. need justice. <laughs> What'd you say? We need justice. We need justice. Right, we that's right. Have to we need justice. 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 We need justice whose members are primarily from eastern hills on the city's edge, the wealthiest and least populated part of town. The activists complain that the council has focused exclusively on development in the resort area at the expense of the city's poor neighborhoods. The city is now facing a $50 million lawsuit, and federal investigators have agreed to look into the two deadly shootings. Solidarity rallies have been held in San Francisco, Montreal, and here in New York. As the world turns its gaze on the Olympics, activists are trying to focus critical attention on the corporate sponsorship of the Games. Amongst these corporate sponsors is Dow Chemical, 
owner of Union Carbide, the company responsible for one of the worst ever industrial catastrophes, the 1984 chemical leak in Bhopal, India. The gas leak killed some 25,000 people, and 500,000 people subsequently developed illnesses including cancer and blindness, or gave birth to children with conditions such as cerebral palsy, partial paralysis, and mental disabilities. Days before the Olympics, a Special Olympics was staged in Bhopal, featuring children left disabled by the disaster. The games were held in an outdoor stadium in the shadow of the pesticide plant where the disaster occurred. Jamila B. brought her wheelchair-bound 11-year-old grandson Amon to take part. Speaking to the Associated Press, B. said, quote, Those people will see that in spite of what they did, these children are still participating, end quote. Dow purchased Union Carbide in 2001, but has repeatedly denied responsibility for the disaster and refuses to add to the $470 million compensation paid by Union Carbide in 1989. Speaking to Reuters, organizers spokeswoman Rachna Dingra said, quote, We have been protesting against Dow's sponsorship of the Olympic Games for a year now. We want them to be dropped, but we have realized this is not going to happen, end quote. The hacker group Anonymous is already making good on its promise to disrupt the games. Last weekend alone, at least 100 websites belonging to Olympic sponsors were shut down and denied service. Some of the attacked sites included Coca-Cola, BT, British Airways, GlaxoSmithKline, Freshfields, and eight Freemason sites, including the oldest Grand Lodge in the world, and some banks. When a particular site goes down, it reads, a gift from Anonymous. A street art movement called Brandalism popped up in the UK last week. The Brandalism project aims to challenge the authority and legitimacy of the advertising industry with 50 different pieces installed on reclaimed billboards. 37 billboards were reclaimed across Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, Bristol, and London in the days leading up to the Olympics. The project is a collaboration between 25 artists from eight different countries and a variety of artistic backgrounds. The Brandalists installed and documented their work over the course of a five-day road trip across England. The latest installation criticizes the handling of the 2012 London Olympics. A billboard in East London's Bethnal Green features police officers in formation with the Olympics tagline, Inspire a Generation. The artwork also displays the official protester logo, which was created by the group Space Hijackers. The art takes aim at the use of so-called brand police to protect corporate interests during the Olympics. One of the installers of the piece, Charlie Dempton, said, quote, the absurd use of brand police to protect corporate interests, the eviction of residents from their homes, the rounding up of graffiti artists with no legal basis. These are some of the Olympic legacies of London 2012." End quote. London police are restricting public expression and the use of images and words associated with the London 2012 Olympics. They want to make sure that McDonald's, Coca-Cola and other brands shelling out millions of dollars for Olympic ad space are the only ones who profit from the games. The Brandalism Project is one of the largest subvertising campaigns ever executed, and it has received a lot of attention from the international press, of course. The act of transforming a corporate advertisement with an anti-consumerist message is not a new idea. Robert Montgomery is a Scottish artist and one of the participants in the project. He says he has been hijacking billboards and turning them into poetry for several years. The Brandalism project was developed over the course of eight months and was launched along with a website and a catchy new name, which was borrowed from Banksy, the, UK, the UK's most infamous street artist. The project has already inspired other artists around the world to submit photos of their own attempts at brandalism. The group's website says the movement builds on the guerrilla art traditions of the 20th century and takes inspiration from the Dadaists, Situationists, and street art movements. A statement from the group reads, quote, 
We are tired of being shouted at by adverts on every street corner. So we decided to get together with some friends from around the world and start to take them back one billboard at a time. We're lab rats for ad execs who exploit our fears and insecurities through consumerism. I'm a human being, not a consumer. So by taking these billboards, we are taking these spaces back, end quote. The question remains, will UK police erase these acts of brandalism? They have already threatened to paint over iconic works by Banksy, but they have not yet taken action. Education for liberation. That's the idea behind the Paul Robeson Freedom School. The new commu community supported school in Williamsburg is in the tradition of similar initiatives going back to the civil rights movement throughout the American South in the early 1960s. Freedom schools were originally set up as grassroots efforts to create social, economic, and political equality in underserved areas of the United States. Many are still in existence, including the Native American Aquasasne Freedom School, teaching the cultural and linguistic heritage of the Mohawk people, as well as the Paulo Freire Freedom School in Tucson, Arizona, named after the influential Brazilian educator and philosopher who authored the book Pedagogy of the Oppressed. The Freedom School in Brooklyn was started by a group of Occupy protesters following in that tradition. The historic red brick building housing the school was made available by a local church. Many Occupy movement participants, with the help of nearby community members, are improving the available facilities, which include a cafeteria, library, media lab, three classrooms, and an open backyard. Occupy Brooklyn TV visited the school and spoke with some of the organizers there. Here's what they had to say. Freedom School is an idea that was developed in 1964 in Mississippi. And it was developed because uh, there were no, uh, there were uh, difficulty. The system wouldn't allow African Americans to be educated at all. Here's a group of people who I know are very interested in some of the same kind of struggles that I am right now in the city. Uh, I've worked with some of them in the past through Occupy and I couldn't help but reach out and want to invite them to the farm for a day of kind of learning and excitement in the gardens. So the community got together and they formed these uh, volunteer schools back in the 60s. They formed these volunteer schools where t retired teachers would get together in the community and uh, in churches and they would start classes because uh, the system, the education system was uh, failing the students and uh, African Americans could not be educated. So what we're doing here, myself and Justin uh, and the other teachers here, what we're doing here is re we're recreating the freedom schools from the uh, 60s. The Paul Robeson Freedom Project, of which this school is one element, is a, an endeavor uh, undertaken by the Coalition for Public Education, which is a, in itself a group, a partnership of many education activists grassroots activists in New York City. And the Brooklyn group of it, myself, Rodney Dees, uh, David DuBose, and many other longtime activists with many more years experience than myself, we came together and decided that we wanted to create an alternative school, a, a freedom school, in the spirit of the freedom schools of the South in the 60s, of the community control movement for local control of education and for community control of education. We're currently, as Chris was said, sitting in the library. Um, we, uh, after the NYPD threw out our books last November, rebuilt our collection, and it's been housed in several different places um, for a long time. It was housed in a building um, with the, uh, the teachers' union. We've had it in storage in Manhattan for a couple months, and, and now we have it here. Um, we're so happy to have it out of storage because now it's use, usable again. Um, and it's really a symbiotic relationship between us and the school, and that they get this fabulous collection. We get a place to stick our books, and we're so happy to have people be able to use them. About a week ago, the Paul Robeson Freedom School came to visit me at the DeKalb Farm, which is a project I've been working on for the past two years. It's in downtown Brooklyn as part of the decal market. Um, and basically the kids came. Uh, 
you know, I'd spoken to Rodney and Justin beforehand about possibly setting up a uh, field trip that they could come, get their hands dirty, learn about uh, where food comes from and some of the governing factors as to why the food that they find on the shelves in the grocery store is as it is. Um, and they ended up coming on a rainy day. It was really fantastic. We got wet, we got muddy. It was really fun. Um, and they did a harvesting project where they got to learn about some different vegetables they'd never known before. Uh, we made lunch together. We talked a lot about gardening in the city and how they could grow food themselves. And uh, yeah, it was a really fun day. The vision is culturally African-Americans and Latinos, when this community where we're in now is predominantly African-American and Latino, they never get any culturally relevant curriculum. And so what, uh, you know, it's happening here is that the African-American and Latino students are learning about their culture. It's a very collaborative environment. It's a very um, evolving environment. Um, the young people are very excited about the programming here, about the curriculum, which is very culturally relevant. It's really rooted in their African heritage, uh, but also in our shared cultural heritage of social justice activism of uh, struggle uh, against oppression, against injustice. I'm a, real, I'm a real life librarian in the real world. Uh, so I come in here on the weekends and, and in the evening. And right now we're still kind of getting everything in order uh, since we just brought over boxes and boxes oh, yeah. of stuff all mixed together. So that's the work we've been doing lately is separating out fiction and nonfiction, getting all the history books together, stuff like that. Um, and then hopefully we'll be teaching um, the students here at the school and other community members how to run the library, so teaching librarianship skills yeah, and then and today, if there's any interest Tuesday, also doing the kind of normal here. teaching that librarians yeah, do, yeah. bibliography yeah. and, and yeah. things like that, you know, kind of like the homework yeah. help style yeah. stuff that public librarians and school librarians often do. I grew up in the city and uh, was one of those kids who had no idea where a carrot comes from, thought it, you know, grew on the shelf in the grocery store. Uh, and as a uh, I kind of grew up, became more aware of all of the things around me. I started seeing that all of these factors uh, connected to food had a lot to do with power systems, with trade agreements, with all of those things that we're um, affected by on a daily basis. And I think that these things go um, largely unnoticed in a daily grind. You know, in New York, we're all so busy kind of getting from point A to point B. So when I started this farm, it was really important to me to reach out to young people, especially who were disconnected from, you know, the food system. Uh, the program that I've been running for the last two years uh, caters to shelter youth who are eating largely institutional food, which is the pits <laughs> by far. Um, and so, you know, we've been reaching out, trying to get people involved in uh, taking control of their food system. The public school that myself and Justin had to go into because uh, they were being uh, uh, what they call phased out. It's a process that happens here in the United States and America, New York specifically, where the mayor has complete control over the school system. And there's no community, no, no, none, of, none of the uh, stakeholders here in New York are a, at the table making decisions for their children. So the need comes up, where can me, as a parent, have my voice heard in the public school system? Well, not in New York, because the public school system is controlled by the mayor. One man decides how the children are gonna be educated. We live in a world of immense opportunity, but we limit ourselves, and our culture, in a way, limits us. And so, Occupy isn't dead. It's nowhere near dead. We know that. They've been writing the obituary for Occupy Wall Street since September 18th. This is, no, this is nothing new to those of us who've been engaged in the struggle. But if you came down to Occupy, if you went to Zakati Park and you felt that energy, and then you left, and you haven't been back in a while, or you wonder where it is or what's going on, take a look here at the Paul Robeson Freedom School. Go check out all of the amazing work that's come about as a result of Occupy and start a project of your own. It doesn't have to be called Occupy, that doesn't really matter. What matters is the commitment to trying to make a change, the commitment to exploring new possibilities, 
the, uh, the opening of new opportunities, the opening of new possibilities for people. So don't, don't get discouraged, you know, stay positive and share with us what you're doing and we'll, we'll work together. The Occupy Town Square assemblies continue to blaze a trail through the outer boroughs of New York City. Gatherings have been held every few weeks in neighborhoods such as Bedford-Stuyvesant, Fort Greene, and Bushwick in Brooklyn, Tompkinsville Square in Staten Island, and most recently at Jackson Heights Travers Park in Queens. The day-long occupations feature teach-ins on issues ranging from the privatization of New York City's inner schools, inner city schools, excuse me, the battle for affordable housing, student debt assemblies, and the school to prison pipeline. The Bushwick Occupy Town Square saw bilingual English and Spanish assemblies, which lasted for hours. Occupy Queens coordinated the Jackson Heights event on Sunday, July 22nd, with a lively local farmer's market. The Tax Dodgers, a street theater group wearing sports jerseys resembling those of the old Brooklyn Dodgers, were also on hand, accompanied by the hula hoop wielding cheerleading squad, the Corporate Loopholes. The team had just come from a ceremony inducting them into the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. Participants enjoyed music, fresh food, dancing, and cultural performances while children got their faces painted. Here is a sample of sounds and sights from that day. My name is Jim Steer, and this is the Occupy Queens celebration in Travers Park on 78th Street in Jackson Heights, Queens. We are here to celebrate life in the city. We're doing, um, we're doing screen printing. We've been working with Occupy Wall Street since September. Basically the process is you have an image that works like a stencil on a screen. So this is the free literature table of A New World in Our Hearts, which is an anarchist network in New York City that's been active for the last six years or so. This is a celebration. It's not an angry protest. So come, we'll discuss the state of the world, the state of art, and have some laughs. What we do is we bring this table around to different parts of the city. We were all of us in one way or another working within the movement. Uh, there are some people in this project now who are working with safer spaces, uh, with uh, people of color, with the Women's Caucus, um, and facilitation. So you can kind of see through where the design is. I got involved with Occupy Wall Street when I was in my senior year in high school. Justin Reeders and Rodden Diaz came and taught me about the privatization of the public school education and the corruption in the government. We have all sorts of literature on, on various topics that we think are important, but they're all from an anarchist perspective. So it's as, as varied as historical writings that people are interested in from sort of more well-known anarchists to very, very recent writings, like this is only a month old. Um, this is written by um, a, a former Black Panther. Um, we have basic stuff. Restorative justice actually historically is extremely old. It, the process of healing harm in a community goes back thousands of years in different cultures. And I started doing sittings, teaching, working with the media, going on radio station and being interviewed and give more people more insight on what's going on in our schools and when it's one being phased out. Just trying to squeegee across it and it forces the ink through this fine mesh. We've had uh, the Brooklyn Free Store, the Bedside Free Store um, before. We uh, put on movie nights. We have freegan community dinners uh, twice a month in Brooklyn. Anybody who wants to come can come and cook, and we'll only use food that would have gone to waste otherwise. How do you make those prints? Uh, the screen itself? Yeah. It's kind of like a photography process. You put a light-sensitive chemical on the screen, and then you expose it in a dark room with a positive transparency of the image that you want to Create, and then wherever the dark spots are on the image, it'll leave a hole in the screen. If it's not some of the school because they're labeled as failures, quoted by the public education of New York City, DOE. Restorative justice is actually a way of, of bringing together 
somebody who's done some harm, somebody who's been hurt, and then members of the community who are either involved or distant from it, and then observers. legal system, it's restorative justice is used with lawyers, it's a way of replacing sentencing, for example. The majority of citizens don't have a say in the rules uh, by which they're governed. Um, and, and people are interested when you talk about anarchism as a way that people can uh, actually be more involved in their communities. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching Occupy Brooklyn TV. See you next week.